Good morning. Good to see everyone here in the room and everyone joining us online. Great to have you as well. I'm Matt. I'm the pastor here. If you're here for the very first time, you are coming to the second week of our series on wisdom from the book of James. Pastor Chad, our Harrisonville campus pastor, did a fantastic job opening up the series last weekend, and I'm going to jump into it this weekend. One of my favorite books in the New Testament, James starts off the book telling who he is. James, the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. He actually was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. They shared the same mother Mary, but he was not a believer in Christ, not for many, many years. He didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ, was the Messiah, wasn't a follower of Christ. It was notable um, that his own family didn't follow him except for his mother Mary, but she had an advantage. God had spoken her through an angel before his birth and said this would be the Messiah, but none of the rest of the family accepted him as a Messiah. So why is there a book written by the brother who didn't believe? Well, at some point he did believe right after the resurrection of Christ. Right after the resurrection of Christ, we learn that James is converted to Christianity and not only is he converted, how many of you know that if you see your dead brother risen again, it might leave an impression on you? Yeah, so it leaves an impression on him. It leaves such a dramatic impression on him that he quickly goes from someone who's not a follower of Christ to the very first pastor of the very first church in all Christianity. He was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. Wow. So he's the very first pastor of the very first church in Jerusalem. And as the pastor of the church, he's writing this book and he says, James, the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the church scattered among the nations. Scattered because they had, in about 40 years after the death, uh, the death and resurrection of Christ, they'd been scattered among the nations because there had been, Rome had come in in a real serious way, and uh, they had done all sorts of damage in the temple, the people had been scattered, there was great persecution, that Christians were being killed by the Jewish leaders at the time, and so they begin to flee for their lives so that they can survive, and they're scattered among all these nations. But James still has a heart for the people that he's pastored for so many years. He's suffering through. He's surviving there in Jerusalem, but not for long. It's not long after this that he's beheaded for his faith. But before that occurs, he gets a chance to write to all the people that he's loved and pastored so well. As you guys read last week, it starts off, we start off the series with the passage where it says, count it all joy my brothers, when you fall into trials of various kinds, all kinds of different trials, because you know that that trying of your faith will work perseverance in you, and that perseverance must work as complete work, that you'll become complete, mature, lacking in nothing. And then we jump to verse 12. For he who endures will receive the crown of life for those who endure. And he walks through this process of endurance. When you're going through a trial, you persevere. You stay in there. You hang in there. You don't quit on God. You don't quit on faith. You hang in there all the way through that. And as you persevere, God can complete and mature you and make you a good, solid Christian so that you're not lacking a bunch of stuff that Christians need to have to be mature believers. And eventually, there's this crown of life. Now, how many of you could relate to having trials in your life? You say, I know what that's like. I've been there. Now, Pastor James deals with probably the second largest area that Christians, or maybe, actually, I think he deals with the first largest area in the second half of the chapter. The first half, he's saying, you're going through trials. And they uniquely were going through trials. Persecuted, businesses shut down, some of their family members executed for their faith in Christ and run out and trying to start up new lives and new businesses. How many would say, that's trials, uniquely so, right? I mean, we're going through trials and we know what's going on in America, but we haven't all had our family members executed, our businesses, I know we've had some businesses shut down, we've had some family members pass away, but it was at a, at a scale that we haven't experienced. Then he gets to the second part, and he says, so we talked about the trials and the cycle that you go through of the trial and the persevering and the maturing, and finally in heaven, the crown of life. Now let me talk to you about sin. 
How many of you know sin is kind of a big issue if you're a Christian? How many of you know that if you're not a Christian, you still, sin is a big issue whether you know it or not, the temptation to do things, there's two kinds of sins. Everyone should know this, there's two kinds of sins. There's the sins that you do that are sins of commission, you commit something. You do something God said don't do. And then there's the sins of omission. You don't do the things that God said to do. You don't love your neighbor as you love yourself. God, it's not like you committed something evil against them. You just didn't do, you didn't forgive. God said to forgive, but you didn't do it. You didn't share your faith. God said to share faith, but we didn't. How many of you say you're probably just as guilty of sins of omission as you are of sins of commission? Okay, And it's real easy when we grow up in church to hear about all the don'ts, right? Don't do this, don't do that. All the sins of commission. Don't commit this sin. And we forget about all the sins of omission, the things God has called us to do as an, in a life of obedience that we're not doing. And so James begins to walk through the sin cycle and begins to say, we got to deal with sin that's going on in your life. I heard the story about a guy who was on a diet. He'd had a problem with gluttony. And he, his particular craving was donuts and coffee from his favorite shop in town. And every day on the way to work, he'd pick up a couple donuts and a cup of coffee, and that added up over time. How do you know that can add up over time? Now, I'm not going to act like I'm super pure and innocent here about this kind of thing because my brother-in-law is in from Chicago. He always looks up the best restaurants in Kansas City, shows up in town, and wants us to eat all weekend. And he's here, and so guess what he had whenever we saw him on Friday night? Hertz Donuts. So I was like, come on, man. I'm trying to do better. I just ate too much you know, on vacation, and now I come home and I got Hertz Donuts waiting at my mother-in-law's house. But he, he's driving, he's realizing he's committed. Okay, God, I'm, I'm going to lay off. I'm going to lay off my donuts. I'm going to lay off my thing, and, and I'm going to do better here, God. You know I got a problem, and, and all this. He's he really trying, but he's driving that way to go to work. And he says, I, God, I just want a cup of coffee. And he's like, no, I know I can't get a cup of coffee because I can't get a cup of coffee without getting a donut. And he's driving, he's just trying to make it work in his brain. And finally says, God, you know there's never any parking. That place is jam-packed all the time. You got to park down the street to find anything. But if there's a spot right in front of the place, I'll know that it's okay with you for me to have a donut this morning. <laughs> and sure enough, on the seventh time around, there was an open spot. <laughs> a lot of us want to break up with sin, but we want to kind of keep the relationship in reserve. We want to put it away, but we just want to kind of keep in touch with it a little bit. And James is pastoring his people how to deal with it and understand what's going on when sin's kind of happening in your heart, how it's getting going, getting started, how it might start to own you in some specific ways. And so we're going to learn how to do it. Now, before James says this is where sin gets going in your life, he stops and he says, here's what it's not. It's not this. Sin's not this. And it didn't come from here. And then he turns his attention to sin is this. And here's where it came from. And so we'll look at verse 13 here first. This is what it's not. James 1, 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. God, why did you do this to me? You knew I couldn't resist this and that. And you let that happen. And You ever tried to blame it on God a little bit? I mean, you could have stopped it, God. Guilty. You, you could have, yeah, whatever. Don't blame it on God. God cannot be tempted. You're, you're never being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with, an, with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Now, I, I'm going to give you, for all of you that love to dig into theology a little bit more deeply, there's two little subtle theological questions that that verse introduces that will resolve as we continue to study the passage in verse 14 and 15. The two ones are this. It says, God tempts no one with evil. The word that it used for tempts is a Greek word, paramos, which is the same word that Chad used last week when he read and he said, when you face trials of many kinds, the testing of your faith, testing, trials and temptations guess what they're all the same greek word paramos 
and we know that God does put us through trials. Job is a great example. Even Jesus uh, says he tried Philip when he said to Philip, Philip, come up with the money to pay for all these people to get food. I, where would I come up with that kind of money? It says, and Jesus said this to try Philip, for he knew what he would do. Jesus knew he had multiplied the bread and the fish, and he would feed the crowd. He tried him. So we know that God actually does bring paramos our way, trials, temptations, testings. So how is that that God doesn't, but yet he does? We'll answer that in the passage. You'll figure that out as we go. And the other one, it says, and neither can God be tempted by sin. But how many of you know that Jesus is God? And was Jesus tempted by sin? Hebrews tells us plainly, and he was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. And we know that when he was fasting in the wilderness for 40 days, Satan tried to tempt him to sin. So, anyway, that'll be resolved as we go through this because it does raise a couple theological questions. And a few of you were like, what? God can't be tempted by sin. Jesus was tempted by sin. And you're wondering. So, just so you know, we'll get there. So, don't get hung up on that. Just wait, and, and we'll hit that here in a little bit. Now, the reason why I think James is dealing with sin is because it's like the big issue if you're a Christian. Sin is the thing that causes us to be alienated from God in our relationship. It's the reason that Jesus Christ had to come to earth. He had to die to pay the price for our sins because sins send people to hell for all eternity and someone had to pay the price for our sin so that we can become the righteousness, declared righteous, even though we weren't living it out yet, declared the righteousness of God in Christ. And what Jesus did, we get to be considered righteous even though we're really not righteous. God just says, Jesus, you want to take your righteousness and put it on Matt so I can call him righteous? You can, can do that. It's your righteousness. Do you want it? Yeah, I'm putting my righteousness on Matt. You can declare him righteous. Now, I still got to grow. I still got to become purified I, because sin is damaging to my relationship. It's damaging to my walk with God. It's damaging to my witness. It's damaging to my marriage. It's damaging to my own identity, to my own sense of In every way, sin destroys the human being. And so how many, you know, you need to overcome it for your own life, right? But it can also still eventually lead you to hell. That can still happen. So you've got to deal with sin. So he starts to get into the process of saying, this is what it is. What's not, it's not God doing it. What it is, and how do you deal with it? And so let's take a look at what it is and how you deal with it. And we'll look at 14 and 15. This is what James says in James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? By his own desires who's his that's yours right his own desires when desire uh, then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown gives birth to death we're going to break that down because this is so important he's giving us a process and if we learn the process we'll learn how to short circuit the process we'll learn how to cut it off before it gets a hold of us and its claws are sunk in deep. How do you save yourself from sin before sin is a habit that you can't break? Because how many of you know sin can very quickly become a habit that's really hard to break? I'm thinking of the song, You're a Hard Habit to Break. I, I went way back to the 80s, sorry. That's Chicago. Anyway, I had the album, I know. I can sing the whole thing and I won't. Everyone, every, the point, I'm going to give you five ways, five steps of the desire process, of the sin process, and I want you to write them down, all five. Here you go. Number one, write this down. Everyone has desires. Everyone say that with me. Everyone has desires. There's nothing wrong with that. Everyone has desires. And it says each one is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire, but there's nothing wrong with the fact that you have desire. How many of you know there's nothing wrong with the fact that you desire to have lunch today? God's like, oh, you're so sinful, you want lunch, I can't believe you. You know, there's nothing wrong with the desire to earn money. Money itself is an evil. It says money is the root of all kind of evil, but money itself is an evil. Money can be a blessing, can be a really good thing. How many of you know it becomes a problem when it becomes greed, right? But the desire 
is there's nothing wrong. And the desire to get married and have some, a spouse to enjoy the gift of a sexual relationship with. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with those desires. And you can go through all kinds of other desires. It's not sinful to have those desires. And we think of all these things. We're like, I'm a terrible person because I... Yeah, you're not a terrible person because you have desires. How many of you understand that even Jesus got hungry? Do you get that? Jesus had every desire. So we say, well, was Jesus... Uh, had every desire like humans have? Sure, he had every desire. He was human. He had all the desires like you and I have, and he didn't sin. So was he tempted by those desires? This is the second part of this. The second thing you want to write down here is desires can lure us. Does everyone say that with me? With me. Desires can lure us. And, and it goes on in that passage, but in verse 14, it says this, but each person is tempted when he is lured, and enticed, kind of the same idea, just doubling up on it, when each person is lured and enticed by his own desire. So we have the desire, but then we get lured by it. What does that mean to get lured by it? It means that we desire for it to do more than God intended for it to do. Food was meant to feed the body and energize us, but now we want it to comfort us from sorrow. Oh, well, it wasn't meant to do that. Now we're lured and enticed into it. The sexual relationship was meant for a bonding and a completion within the context of one man, one woman for lifetime, marriage. And now we want it to do something. We're lured and enticed to do something more with that. Money was meant to pay the bills and allow us to live a comfortable life and maybe bless and give and help some other people. And now all of a sudden money becomes our purpose for living because if we have that, it's our fulfillment. It replaces God and becomes an idol. It lures us to go further. Was Jesus ever lured by desires? Yeah, he was. Remember when Satan took him out into, he was in the wilderness fasting, and Satan took him up on a high mountain and said, look at all the kingdoms of the world. Yeah, I see him. If you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Now, was the desire of Jesus to rule over the world a sinful desire? No. It was a good desire. God had made him to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords to rule over all of the world. How many of you understand he was destined for that purpose? But he was not supposed to get it by Satan worship. You understand that? God may have destined you for many things, but if you choose to get it in some sinful, selfish, self-asserting, prideful kind of way, how many of you know, or illegal way, or dishonest way, or deceptive way, God wants you to maybe marry that girl, but don't lie to her about your past. Don't be a deceiver to get married. Amen, someone? God may want you to get that opportunity at work, but don't take credit for someone else's work to get the job they deserve. Do your own work, right? So there's all these lurings into good, godly things, but we want to do them the wrong way. Was Jesus lured? Absolutely. Because he was lured, did it mean he, did Jesus ever sin? No, he never sinned. He had desires, those desires lured him. Here's a question. Can God lure you to sin? Absolutely not. So it says God never tempts you. God never lures you. He'll allow you to go through the test where you could be lured, but God's hoping you won't. God's hoping you'll resist it. God's hoping you'll stand strong and that you'll endure. And in fact, in the first part, it says you're going through a trial, a, a paramos, at the very first part of chapter 1, later on he says, God never puts you through a paramos. God's putting you in a testing time, but God's never going to use that testing to tempt you to sin. God's hoping you will do like the first part of chapter 1 said, that you will persevere and endure during that temptation and that trial and that difficult season, and you'll become complete, mature, and not. that's what his goal is. 
When God puts you in a tough time, his goal is that you'll resist the lady at work that, or the guy at work that's trying to start up an unhealthy relationship with you as a married man or married woman. And you're like, hey, I'm not going down that road. I'm not being lured into this. You're not going to entice me. I know that's a desire um, that human, that men and that women have, but I'm not going down that road. And so we go through trials, but we can resist those things and say, I'm not going to be lured into it. And then we go to this next step in the process, and this is where things fall apart. This is where the wheels start coming off. I want to take a look at this real quick. The third point right here is it tells us that we're lured into conception. Lured into conception. Let's read verse 15. Verse 15 tells us this. Can we pull that up? James chapter 1 and verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. There's a point in the process, and I want you to hear this, because this is the big kind of moment for you that I hope you'll have an awakening and, and you'll get it. There's a point when your desire that's enticing and that's luring is not sin, and it, you're okay, and you don't need to feel guilty, you don't need to repent of anything, you just need to say, whoa, I'm backing away from that. That's some bad stuff. That could get me in trouble. I don't want to mess with that. But then there's this spot that's kind of nebulous, kind of hard to describe, where you cross the line and sin is conceived in your heart. It begins. It starts. There's a birth. There's a, a conception that goes on. And I think what that is, the best way I can describe that is it's when you now willfully want the thing that is wrong and your mental faculties are actively engaged in the imagining of acting on it. You're processing, I'm going to do it. How do, you just haven't figured out how to act out the sin, but in your brain, you're working it out. How many of you have ever been there? Every, oh, come on. How many of you are human? My goodness, you've all been, if you are human, you feel so bad saying that. I sinned. I can't believe that I'm telling the whole world that I sinned. I'm going to raise my hand and tell you real quick. I've sinned. Anyone want to raise your hand to say, I've sinned too? Guess how you did it? Your own evil desire lured and enticed you, and at some point, it conceived it gave birth, and it's like, ah, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to sin. I'm going to tell the lie. I'm going to drink the drink at the party. And when I told God, I, I know other people can drink alcohol, but I have an addictive thing in me, and so I can't. I don't know what your thing is. God tells different people. How many of you know there's a list of sins in the Bible that none of us are supposed to do? Let me give an amen, get an amen on that. But how many of you know that God can make up his own little list for you because you got a problem with something that uh, maybe other people don't? And he's like, for you, you just better not mess with that because you can't handle that. Right? And if you're sensitive to God, he'll say, no, you can't mess with that. Okay? I know everyone else gets to. But how many of you know if you got a bunch of different kids, sometimes you got to change the rules up for different ones of them? It's just the way it goes. If you're a good parent, you kind of figure this one out and say, well, you can't handle that. She can't handle that. They need, you know, whatever. You, you mix it up to take care of each kid in the way they need to be taken care of. So God is a good father. He loves you. And he's going to take care of all the little things and, and tell you on these things, no and no and no. So sin gets conceived in our hearts and we start imagining how we're going to do it, how we're going to act out on the sin. Here's my question. Do you think that sin was ever conceived in Jesus' heart? No. I'm with you. Didn't happen. Sin was never conceived in the heart of Jesus because when you conceive sin, guess what you've done? You've sinned. What? If I conceive the sin, just thinking about I want to do it means that I'm guilty before God as if I've done the sin. In Matthew... Um, well, I'll jump to a different passage. Matthew chapter 5, 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with, what's it say? With lustful intent. That's the important word right here. Lustful intent 
has already committed adultery with her in his where in his heart it's the intent how many of you know that god looks at the heart he looks at your heart and so what have we got it real this is the moment this is what what do we got to do we got to stop it before we start thinking about how to do it if you're thinking about how to do it you stepped over the line if you're being lured into it now where jesus did it was always back at the okay i've got a desire satan's trying to lure me worship me and you'll get everything you want do this and you'll get what you want act on this and you get what it's always you'll get what you want if you sin you'll be happy you'll be fulfilled you'll be satiated whatever it is just do it and you'll be fulfilled and Jesus, always before it became okay, I want to do it. So always before the okay, the conception, he would stop and say, no, no. Get behind me, Satan. For the word of God says, thou shalt worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Over and over. To tell these stones to turn into bread. I'm on a fast. I can't tell stones to turn into bread. I've committed myself to a 40-day fast with God. Just tell the stones to turn into bread. No, I'm trying. I've committed this to God right now. It's right for me to do this. Just turn it into bread. No, the word of God says, thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I'm not going to do that. Throw yourself down for the temple to prove to your God. No, I'm waiting until my resurrection to prove that I'm the son of God. No, throw yourself down for the temple. Angels will catch you. Everyone will know and everyone will worship you now. No, God has a plan. I've got to follow his plan. Just do it. Just throw yourself down. And then you'll get all the trials and struggles and everything over. Everyone will just follow you and worship you. I'm not going to do that. Always at the desire, at the enticement point is where you win but once you've gone past the enticement into the conception of sin, you're thinking about how to do it. How many of you know when you're thinking about how to do it, you've already half lost the battle? Now, when you're thinking about how to do it, it's time to repent. God, I am so sorry that my brain is doing this to me right now. I do not want to be thinking about this. God, forgive me. I, I'm turning away. I'm not going to do that. And you get your mind on something else and you move on with your day. Amen? How many of you know you can get it turned around still there? Even though you have to say, I'm sorry, and ask, how many of you know that God will forgive you? And the hooks aren't sunk in too deep. And so you can probably shake free of it. It's like you bit on the hook, but you just nibbled on it. They didn't yank it yet, it hadn't sunk in. So get your mouth off that hook real quick. Say, I'm sorry. And step away and move on with your day, right? So we're still at a place where we can get some victory in our life. But this next point starts getting hard. Next point starts setting in. The hook starts setting. The fourth one, conception leads to full-grown sin. James 1, 15. Once again, we're going to keep hitting this. The desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin... Think about that, gives birth to sin. Why does he say it conceived? Well, now in our hearts, we're imagining it. It's, we got the image. We can see it happening. We can see ourselves doing it. We're imagining it. And then what happens after we do that? It gives birth. Birth means it's the outward expression of the inward act. We have now done it. We actually acted, it gave birth to it, it's visible, everyone can see. Maybe it's a hidden sin that we're not letting people see. It's behind closed doors kind of sin. It's in front of the computer screen kind of sin. And no one but you and Jesus and Google know. Okay? And, and right now, we stepped over the line and we're over here now in the active part of sin but we still got a chance to cut it off here. Okay, right here, it's, how many of you know it's easier to cut off a one-time activity than a habit? It's a lot easier right now to say, whoa, put the brakes on it, stop it right now, don't let myself get down that road, I gotta get out of this quick, and, and, and I probably wouldn't hurt to confess this not only to God, but I need a brother or sister in Christ that's mature enough to handle my confession and pray for me right now. 
That would help me to just have accountability right now so I don't get pulled into a lifestyle of sin. It's one thing to think of it. It's, a, it's another thing to act on it, but oh, to keep acting on it becomes like an addiction, a habit. And those are hard to break. And I don't want to get there. I don't want to be stuck there. This fifth one, this fifth one, this is where things get really tough. Full-grown sin leads to old, dead sinners. So what it says in verse 15, once again, verse 15, so much there, then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. We did it. We acted on it. But when sin is fully grown, fully grown, it brings forth death. He's not just meaning we die when we get old. He's meaning the sin destroys spiritual life within us. We become spiritually dead to God. That means hell is our home. That means we've lost relationship with Christ. But how does that happen? It says it only happens when sin becomes fully grown. What does that mean to become fully grown in sin? When you're fully grown in sin, it becomes your adjective that people describe you by. It becomes your identity. They are a liar. They are an adulterer. They are a boastful, prideful, angry, abusive. Have you ever had to describe someone that way? It's become their identity. It's fully grown into who they are now. They are, they, they don't just do a sin. They are the sinner. They are that in their identity. It is the fruit of their life is that. That's who they are. Now, the only way for something to become fully grown is your identity is if you do not repent of it. How many of you know that anywhere along the habit process, the habit can be broken through repentance and through healing? But repentance, so many people and Christians don't understand repentance. They think repentance means to say, I'm sorry. I'm so, and maybe say it meaningful and maybe even cry and really say they're sorry and and just throw themselves on the ground in front of God and lay in their couch and cry, God, I'm so sorry. And no matter how, it's sorrow and it's crying and it's telling God they'll never do it again and it's all that, that's not repentance. That can lead to repentance. Godly sorrow leads to repentance is what the word of God says. But godly sorrow leads to the act of turning away and living a different life Repentance is the turning part. Now, how many of you know when a hook is sunk really deep into a fish, uh, you got it like right through there and it's all the way through, it takes a, a little bit to get out. But when they swallow the hook, you're afraid you're going to gut the fish to pull the hook out. And when you've gotten into a full-grown sin, you've swallowed the hook. And when God takes the hook out of you, it's going to gut a lot of stuff from your life that you think is your life. You can have a hard time. That's why people in lifestyles of sin do not want to give it up because it's like, I'm going to lose all my friends. It's gutting all your relationships. I'm going to lose my dreams of becoming this, you know, mega millionaire. Greed, ugh, he's having to gut you. I'm going to lose my pride and control of my wife and my kids and my dominance and Cut in half of your life because it's your, become your identity and the hook is way down deep. You swallowed it. And so to repent when it's a lifestyle is hard because he's got to gut the fish. And then when he guts you, he wants to fill you back up with godly aspirations and desires and holiness and gentleness and kindness and form an identity that when people look at you, they say, they're a follower of Christ. They're loving, they're merciful, they're kind, they're generous, they're gracious, they're forgiving. How many of you would love for that to be your identity? But the way that happens is through this process. The only way it becomes full grown is if you don't repent. But if it becomes full grown, it will lead to your spiritual death. It will ultimately lead to your spiritual death. And 
Pastor James is so gracious to us when he says, you cannot let that happen, folks. You just can't let, you gotta cut it off way back here. When you're lured and enticed, before you conceive and imagine doing the sin, before you conceive it, stop there and say, I'm being lured and enticed by my own evil desires. I don't blame it on anyone else. This is my moment, my responsibility. And right here, I have to say, no. I have to say what? And I have to get my mind and my feet going a different direction right now. You got to get your mind and your feet going a different direction or you're staying in a nice close relationship to that sin. No, I'm not going to do it. Tiptoeing over there. So many people say no, but they don't turn and reinvest their mind and their energy someplace holy and godly and healthy. And so I want to encourage you, church. James, the first pastor of the first church, says to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, I need you to count it all joy when you face trials. But I want your trial to lead to perseverance, not to luring and enticing and I want it to lead from perseverance to maturity and completion that you may be mature and complete in Christ, not into conception and sin. Because if you do it this way, ultimately it'll lead to the crown of life. But if you do it this way, that full-grown sin will lead to death. We're all going to go through these trials that will make us want to give up our faith and act out in sinful ways and reward ourselves with bad behavior because life is hard. But would you be the persevering crew instead of the caving crew? Would you be the people that are maturing rather than the ones who are living habitually in the lifestyle? And would you experience the crown of life instead of death? I want to encourage you, church. God has so much more for you. And if you've been burdened and weighed down and carrying a load of sin, it starts with repentance. God, forgive me. Sin requires repentance to God. But habits require healing. James tells us, Confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. John tells us, confess your sins to God that you may be forgiven and that he will cleanse you. James says, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. What's the difference? If I blow it one time, I'm telling God. If I'm stuck in a sin, I need healing. I'm telling a brother or a sister or a counselor, and I'm getting prayed for, for healing through accountable relationships. So I want to tell you this morning, if you're struggling with a one-off here and there, let's just pray this morning. Let's get our hearts right. Let's get forgiven. But if you're in a habit, you need healing, and you need confession to other brothers and sisters you need other people in your life to help you through that. That's why part of why we do small groups. Some of our small groups are really designed for healing and health. That's why there's great Christian counselors out there. That's why you form godly relationships with other brothers and sisters so that there are people around you ready to pray for healing if sin becomes a habit. Amen? So let's just start with our own cleansing before God. Every head bowed, eye closed. I don't want you to take a few moments right now. A few moments as church-wide confession happens. Let's all for a moment say, God, forgive me of this. God, I pray that as confession is happening for everyone online right now and everyone in the room right now, that healing would also be happening that there would be real spiritual work of Christ coming in and restoring what we've lost and what's been broken. 
I pray that people here that are being lured into sin would see it right now and stop the process before it turns into an imagination, a conception of sin in their heart. I pray that it would stop right here and that they would live in freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So let us live in that freedom now. Lord, I pray for everyone who has caved in and it's become a habitual lifestyle of sin and it's hidden and no one knows but them and God and they're living in this sin that they just can't get out of it that you would give them the courage and the wisdom to confess that sin to a brother or sister who is in a place with Christ that they can pray over them for healing from that and confession and accountability and a process to work through. I pray that grace over each person in Jesus' name so that we would live in the liberty that you have purchased on the cross for every one of us to live in and experience. If you receive that in this room, would you give me a big amen? Amen and amen.